Thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, today's talk will be on integrated pest management for rodents presented by Dr. Neve Quinn. Neve is a University of California Cooperative Extension Advisor. She is the Human Wildlife Interactions Advisor based in the uh, Southern California area at the South Coast Research and Extension Center in Irvine. Her focus is directed uh, on the coordination of um, cooperative extension programming regarding wildlife and human conflicts, particularly within the residential and industrial areas in Southern California, where significant human wildlife conflicts are occurring. Her research and education focus is on everything from mice to mountain lions, but she mostly focuses on rodents, their management, and the pathways and effects of rodenticide on non-target wildlife. Great. All right, Neve, you can go ahead and share your slides. Oh, that's can you fantastic. see them? Yes, I okay. love it. Well, I'm go just going to launch straight in and um, I have a lot to cover. And as Carrie said, I'm going to cover all sorts of things, rodent biology, behavior, identification. And so we're going to start with the very, very basic, which is trying to get my slides to advance. There we go. And what is a rodent? Well, a rodents are the there's more rodents on the planet than there is any other mammal and they're small placental mammals and um, which means that they give birth to live young and they have something that we all probably know about which is their incisors that constantly grow but they also have something else that makes them distinctly rodent and that is their diastema which is a gap in between their incisors that constantly grow and their other teeth and what that does is it allows the rodents to stick their cheek or, uh, like this into the gap. And so rodents gnaw all the time and people think it's because they want to wear down their teeth. And actually what they're trying to do is they're trying to figure out what's food and what's not food. And so that's sometimes when you see rodents gnawing on plastic or on metal, that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to figure out, is this food? And so it's really important to understand before we talk about how you control rodents, why we control rodents, especially the commensal rodents, the rats and mice that live among us. One of the things that people aren't aware of is that rats and mice um, carry allergens and they actually carry it in their urine. And so um, we know that rats and mice and also sometimes cockroaches and other animals um, um, are responsible for the early onset of asthma in sensitized children. So that's something important. And it's also something we don't know a lot about. Um, another thing that we are very concerned about is food contamination and so I don't know if you guys remember but in the news a, a couple of years ago like a roof rat fell out of someone's roof onto the buffalo wild wings menu and um, so that was a bit of a, a wild ride um, but we also get them in you know supermarkets and grocery stores and you really get rodents everywhere. They can also cause damage to wires. Um, so obviously um, this guy here on the left hand side um, did is not faring very well after um, his interlude with or her interlude with the um, the um, electrical wire. This is a gas line. And then this is becoming more and more prevalent, which is the damage of wires under the hood of, of cars. And so one of the things that you have to do is you have to try and event, identify where rodents are. And there's a couple of things that you can do. You can look for scat, which is kind of like their poop or their droppings, their feces. Look for tracks and runs, which are associated with certain species of rats in California. Look for things like urine stains, rub marks and gnawing. Um, and rodent poop is kind of complicated um, because what comes in must come out. And if you woke up in the morning and you know you had a nice breakfast and then you went for lunch and I, I had a kale smoothie but you had in and out and um, even though we're the same species our poop is going to look very very different and so that's something that you have to consider when you're talking about scat and so for roof rats their scats are kind of pointy at one end and um, they're kind of you know rounded at one end and usually pointy at one end but they can be pointed at both ends also um, but they almost always have one pointy end for Norway rats, theirs are, um, you know, quite large droppings. Obviously, you can they can vary in size depending on the size of the rat themselves. But they're kind of like capsular, like almost like um, one of those capsule tab, like little pills that you could take. 
um, and they're generally rounded on both ends. OK, now house mice and deer mice and voles, they do all look very, very different, but their size is incredibly different. So if you look at the size of a deer mouse scat compared to the size of a house mouse scat, it's very, very different. And then voles are herbivores, so they kind of have these long stringy poops. Um, and we're not we're going to talk, talk most, much about voles today, but just for a comparison to show you like how different um, the feces can look for the, the different species. I'm going to play you a video and hopefully it plays. Um, I'm going to turn up the volume. Let me get my pointer here. Boo, boo, boo. There we go. My name is Laura Kruger, and I'm a board certified entomologist and vector ecologist with the Orange County Mosquito and Vector Control District in Orange County, California. The West Coast Rodent Academy has asked me to talk about the key characteristics used for identifying the solid metabolic waste that is excreted by animals. That's right, I get to talk about poop, also called feces, excretia, excrement, droppings, pellets, scat, dung, manure, and some other terms I'm not allowed to mention. For the purpose of this video, let's just call them droppings. Rodent droppings are by far the most prevalent piece of evidence collected to describe unsanitary conditions. They are commonly collected because rodents, and depending on the species, can lay anywhere from 50 to 100 droppings per day, over 18,000 in a year from a single animal. These droppings can be a reliable indication of pest activity. Rodent droppings are cylindrical, covered in a mucus coating, and all of them contain hair from grooming. Because rodents eat a wide range of food, the bait matrix itself can vary. However, the droppings will always contain fur. Norway rats, the largest of the commensal rodents, have droppings which have been described as blunt shaped at the ends. Roof rats, which are on average slightly smaller than Norway rats, have what's been described as banana shaped or slightly pointed droppings at one end or the other. Mice, such as the house mouse, are much, much smaller than Norway and roof rats. And their droppings have been described as spindle shaped, which is tapered at the ends. In general, mouse droppings would be described as small, which is why it can be confusing deciding if it's mouse droppings or droppings from an American cockroach. Insect droppings often have a more symmetrical type shape with ridges. And so with the American cockroach, their droppings are barrel shaped with truncate blunt ends and longitudinal ridges. There is no mucus coating. And in general, they can be a fairly consistent size and shape. Most of the droppings will be smaller than mouse droppings. Also, the egg case of the American cockroach can be confused as um, droppings from Norway rats or roof rats. And so that's why sometimes it may be necessary to crush the feces um, matrix to see what's inside. So how do you identify rodent droppings? How do you know it's a rodent dropping and not an American cockroach dropping? Or how can you tell the difference between rat or mouse droppings? Really, the key is first and foremost, don't guess. Use resources that are available to you in the pest control industry, such as the NPMA field guide, my favorite, and also make sure you have a hand lens 
And of course, document, document, document. Take some pictures. A quick reminder that oftentimes in infestations, there are multiple animals, juvenile or adult, present. So try to collect multiple droppings. It's always better to have more droppings uh, to make a confirm and an identification than less. You may need to actually crush the droppings, so you may need a hand lens or some other supplies. And also, you can always reach out to someone at your local mosquito and vector control district to help to further confirm the identification. Identifying a rodent infestation from droppings may not be your number one choice for identifying an infestation, but it's definitely a solid number two. Feel free to drop me a line or push out an email to your local mosquito and vector control district for assistance. Thank you. And thanks to Laura for that um, really great video. And that's available on our um, the West Coast Rodent Academy website um, if anybody wants to, to re-watch it. Um, and so, you know, like as Laura said, the, the SCAT is one of the first things that comes to mind for identifying rats. Um, other things can be rodent tracks and runs. Um, tracks are often hard to spot and they can be as small as three eighths of an inch, but obviously our bigger rats are much, much bigger, but they can be very hard to find or identify. Usually if you're in something that hasn't been um, has re remained undisturbed for a significant time that has a layer of dust. Sometimes you can see these prints and also tail drags through it. But if you're in areas that have the nori rat, you know, um, Los Angeles, San Francisco, places like that, um, you can often see these runs like here, which are these pathways that these animals habitually take to their burrows. Um, urine stains are also helpful. The only thing is, is that often you need a black light to see them and that not might be not something that's in your, you know, in your pocket every day to day. But just so you know, you can make the rodent urine glow under, excuse me, black light. Rub marks are also very, very helpful for identifying um, rodent signs and also for looking at their travel pathways. For example, you can see a rub mark here and then what we call a swing mark where it can't get across on the beam, uh, on the pipe here because of the beam and it swings around and it continues over and it swings around again. Sometimes they're really, really obvious and sometimes they're a little bit less conspicuous like on this grate here. Um, and often they can also be very, very easily slalled like in this case where they rodent was coming in and out and we were able to exclude the, the rodent from this room by improving the screen on the back of this vent. Rodents always also gnaw um, and depending on your, um, you know, your willingness to inspect, you can often tell the difference between some species of rodents, but also, um, you know, between the size of the rodents, because if you can see clearly, you can see the two incisors um, clearly marcated along here, and that's an indication of the size of the rodent. Now, gnawing can be come in all so sorts of forms, and I'm sure that um, a lot of the people on this webinar have seen some you know, fairly frustrating damage to their um, their fruits and veggies potentially in their backyard. And um, you can see here, this is a sure sign that you have roof rats in the area. This is like a chewed into snail shell. Um, and so you might see that often in areas where roof rats are feeding in your yard. And so that's a good sign. But then some of it's a little bit more obvious like these macadamia nuts um, where the, the rat got into the tree and just you know chewed into all these nuts uh, the shells of these nuts so it could get into the um uh the the good stuff in the middle so the commensal rodents that we're going to talk to about today are the roof rat the house mouse and the nori rat um as far as we know those are the only commensal species um in uh, california um but we know more about polar bears than we do about rats so we're learning more every day now the roof rats um have kind of a restricted distribution in the United States, although they are expanding. They're used to kind of warmer climates, um, you know, kind of like Southeast Asia, you know, kind of more humid, more warm um, environments. And so we get them, um, you know, along the lower half of the East Coast and the Gulf states, 
um, and then along the Pacific coast. And up until recently, they hadn't really been anywhere. And if you look for a roof rat distribution map, you'll find like that they, it looks like they do hug the species, but we are finding them in places like Arizona now, Nevada, Colorado, up into Utah um, and inland as well. Um, you know, potentially beyond some of the Gulf states too. So we're learning more and more and more about the roof rat. Um, roof rats are very sleek and agile. They're about five to 10 ounces. They have these incredibly large ears. Now, not as large as some of our native rat species like the, um, the wood rat, um, but they have these small black eyes and they're kind of light, lightish brown to gray, but their color can be very variable. So they can be kind of an orangey color sometimes. And um, they can be very mo like more brownish gray or like these juveniles in this picture actually quite gray. Um, so it, it's very variable. Color definitely helps, but it's something that you have to be careful about. Um, their tails are uniformly dark. So that means they're the one color the whole way around. They're about six to eight length. Um, the adult itself, the body is about six to eight length, inches long. And then the tail is all, always either as long or longer than the body. And so roof rats and, and nori rats, they're actually kind of similar in length. It's more kind of the bulk of the nori rat. And they also have a much smaller tail that we'll talk about in a minute. Roof rats are nocturnal. They're very, very secretive and elusive. They're actually considered to be more difficult to control than the Norway rat. Um, and you know, the roof rats, the, the rat in California, that's um, more widely distributed. Um, so that's um, a bit of a pain. When they're outside, they like to establish their nests in like dense shrubbery, like bushes and other types of of vegetation that's very, very lush because they use that vegetation to move. So the more overgrown it is, um, you know, they they like the busy freeways, you know, like that they like the, the stuff that's all grown in. They like the um, they like their their like their highway to be very congested almost. Um, but they can use your fence line or any your wall um, and they can also run along utility lines. So that's electrical, you know, phone, things like that. They like to nest in 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 palm trees that haven't been trimmed. I mean, they'll also nest in palm trees that have been trimmed um, and they'll nest as well sometimes on the ground. So sometimes under cavities, sometimes kind of at the bottom of a really thick bush. Um, if you have a kind of a trash pile or a leaf pile or any kind of a wood pile, you can find them in there. And that's just outside. Inside, they can be in like your attic, they can be in your basement, they can be in your wall void, you know, up in your garage, they can be in storage boxes and racks and, you know, they can be um, in like things like silos. And they're really, really, really um, adapted um, rodent. So like, they can be in the penthouse or they can be in the basement and they can be in really great habitats or they can be in not so great habitats. And so rats are able to live very, very well in a number of different habitats. In fact, there's very few habitats that roof rats aren't able to live in. And most of those are just very, very cold. Now, the one thing about roof rats is, is that they can eat a lot of natural foods. So even if you remove a lot of the the stuff in your yard that you would consider a food source so like your citrus your fruit and veggies things that they're kind of you know picking on and um, there's still a lot of natural food in your yard that they can eat so they can eat like seeds and nuts and fruits and, and berries that are naturally occurring in your yard so not things that you've cultivated yourself they can eat slugs and snails cockroaches and um, we even see them eat fish and um, shellfish they're really, really well adapted. And so on the other side of things though, because we, when we live in urban areas, especially there's a lot of other food sources around that can um, cause your population to be even higher. Um, and so we kind of call that anthropogenic food. So like human provided food sources, things like dog food, all the trash that comes in our cans and then all the lovely stuff that we have in our yards. And um, there's definitely a buffet in my backyard and I do my best to prevent the rats from accessing it. And um, the dreaded bird feeder, if you have a bird feeder, um, and you have rats, you're you're almost asking for it. That's a great source of food um, for rodents, um, both rats and mice. And then, you know, um, I think we're changing a lot and we're learning how to provide for ourselves more. And so a lot of the time, a lot of people have, even in urban areas, they have livestock, they have chickens, um, you know, and there's a lot of food associated with that and sometimes bedding. And so that can be a great food source for rats as well. Now rats and roof rats and nori rats, they forage really, really differently. And it's important to know how they forage because it helps inform how you manage. 
So roof rats um, actually feed in multiple locations. So they could live in one area, but they feed in multiple locations. And they usually forage in family groups of around 10. And so if you're doing a rat trapping program right now in your backyard, it'd be interesting to know like how many traps you have. And so how many traps you think you need to catch 10 rats? Um, I don't really know the answer, but if you have only one trap in your yard, that's not, not enough. Um, and rats can carry food back to secluded areas. So that's something that's really important to understand. If you choose to use something like a rodenticide, you have to remember that they could too also carry that to the secluded area. And while they, they may consume it, um, and it's likely that they do consume it, they may also just leave it there if they become disturbed. And what we know about roof rats is, is that they like to eat small amounts in many, many different areas. And so if you're doing a management program, you might want to think about having your management in multiple areas. Now we know that rats um, have something called neophobia or it could be some sort of a device avoidance. It's hard to know, but you can see that this rat is all over this bait station and they just, just never goes in. And so that's something that we have to try and overcome. Um, most um, commands of rodents are between 25 and 100 foot um, home range. And um, we know that rats can commonly travel up to 300 feet. So when you say that those are the neighbor's roof rats, yeah, they probably are. Um, and so as we just discussed, sometimes they live in one place and they forage in the next place. Um, but we've, you know, we see show that rats can travel up to a thousand feet and that's not that uncommon. So it's, it's pretty interesting how they, um, how they move about. Um, now let's move on to the, the smallest of the Comansa rodents or what we call the mammalian weeds. And they're called weeds because they have the most insane ability to reproduce. Um, house mice are the most prolific of the, um, the Comansa rodents, but they're very small. They're about a half an inch. They have a tiny, tiny head. And so that means that if you have a hole that's a quarter of an inch, um, that a mouse can essentially squeeze in there. They have moderately large ears and small black, eye, um, black um, eyes, but they are not anything as large as the, the roof rats. Some people think that mice hibernate, but they don't really. But what happens is if you're in a colder part of this world that they can kind of slow down a little bit. Um, so, you know, there may be times where you have big mouse populations and then all of a sudden you know even if you do nothing they can reduce a bit and it could be because of this behavior now mice are look very different than rats they're a lightish brown to gray um color and they're they're quite uniformly colored although they can be a little bit paler underneath they have an almost hairless tail as do roof rats also and the adults only about five to seven inches long um including the tail so you have to think about that if you're if you get a juvenile roof rat um, how long is it with its tail? And if it's more than seven inches, it's more than likely not um, a house mouse. Now they're omnivorous um, and things that are omnivorous that eat everything are difficult to control because if you take one thing away, they'll just go over and they'll eat something else. They love seeds and grains because they spend a lot of time on the floor and um, like on the ground, um, but they'll end up in, in urban areas, they love dog food. They're not generally neophobic about new food. So remember neophobia is this fear of new things. So it's actually, easier generally a little bit easier to control um house mice it's just the problem with house mice is their sheer numbers when they reproduce mice are a bit like myself they like foods that are high in fat protein and sugar and they can survive on very little water so even if you have a free water source in your home fixing it often can't eliminate your problem now Mouse reproduction is insane. I mean, rodent reproduction in general is pretty crazy, but they can breed all year round if the conditions are favorable. And I guarantee you that if you're in an urban area, almost likely that your conditions are favorable. Um, but like if they're in the outside and they're kind of struggling in the wilds, um, they can be seasonal breeders, but they can have up to five or six litters um, in, a, in a year and they can have up to 10, or sorry, five or six young in a litter and up to 10 litters in a year and they're sexually mature at about six to 10 weeks. So that's like insane, right? Like absolutely insane. And then they have, um, they can, they give birth to their babies 19 to 21 days after conception. So like, they're not like, you know, like human beings that are like, you know, swollen ankles after nine months kind of thing. They're like in and done in, you know, 21 days. It's, it's, it's almost unbelievable. Um, and so you never have one mouse ever, 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 ever. It's more likely, you know, that you have like a very decent population of mice in there. Um, 
And so um, mice are generally nocturnal, like most of our commensal rodents, but it's not that unusual to see them during the day. And just because you see them during the day doesn't mean that you have an absolutely giant infestation. It could just mean that they were, um, you know, just uh, frightened or disturbed in some way. Now they often utilize corners and run along walls, but remember that not all, you know, not all people are right-handed. Right we have some left-handed people too. And, and so it's the same with mice. They might not always run against the wall. The one thing about mice is, is that mice make very, very small excursions, generally between 10 to 30, 30 feet. So it's a case of miss by an inch, miss by a mile. You really have to be very strategic when you um, place your management devices, because if you're too far away, you'll never have a chance of catching any mice. Um, and because they're not neophobic, generally, people, they're very um, uh, like, kind of like explorers, but they're very, very fast. And so they travel up at speeds of up to 12 feet per, per second. And a lot of the time you might notice that if you have mice and you set traps, that often the bait is gone and the trap has been unset, but there's no mouse in it. And that's probably because, well, A, you may have had too much bait in your trap, but also because um, you have, um, they're just so fast that they can get away. Now, lastly, we're going to talk about the nori rat and the nori rat's kind of the fatty of the um, the family and they're the most widely distributed of our commensal rodents. But here in California, we do not find them anywhere or not. We do not find them everywhere. Um, and so that's pretty interesting. And, and like I said, they're very large and robust. They're about 17 to 18 ounces, which is kind of chunky. And um, there's, they have small ears because they're actually a burrowing rodent and you don't want to have big ears if you're a burrowing rodent because you don't want the ears to knock off their burrows. And like I said, they're about the same length as the roof rat, but their tail is much, much shorter. Um, and they also have a uniform um, uh, tail, but their bodies, not really uniform. Their top of them is kind of this reddish brown color, um, and they're, um, you know, they're they're um, kind of a pale color underneath. Now, diet wise, they they have a sl actually a slightly different diet. Um, they eat garbage, um, bird seed, dog food, vegetable and um, compost. They will actually eat backyard livestock as well. Um, and then their natural and semi-natural um, vegetation, things like insects, bird eggs, ground nesting bird eggs, um, you know, carry on. And they'll also eat nuts, berries and seeds. And um, they really like cereals and corns because they do spend a lot of the time on the ground. So I'm going to show you this video very, very briefly. Um, or maybe not. Let's see. There we go. It's an urban dweller's worst nightmare. A rat in the toilet. It's scary, but it does happen. Good afternoon, we reach rodent Washington, D.C.'s rodent control receives a couple of complaints each year. You have a rat in your toilet? How does this ultimate rat invasion actually occur? First, it could easily sneak into grates or manhole covers open to the street. Residential sewer pipes feed into the main tunnel. A rat might consider this path an irresistible opportunity for exploration. Its sharp claws allow the rat to scale almost any vertical surface. The rat is in the home's internal pipes, going up. Now it faces the biggest test, getting through the last few feet of the narrow, maze-like toilet pipes. Is this even possible? The underwater passage leaves no room for error. At a turn, the rat finds a pocket of air, just enough to help it push on to the... How does it collapse its body like that? Um, what if someone flushes? All right, so you get the idea. Rats are just really unbelievable animals. And so nori rats can swim really well, but a lot of, of the ratus rats, so a lot of that genus, can actually spend significant time in water. And roof rats will in fact use the sewer system also, but in general, in the really big metropolitan areas in California, it is the nori rat that's using the cellar or the sewer system. Um, but nori rats are really good burrowers as well. And they use burrows for protection against predators and they'll make them in roads and paths and in walls and essentially in kind of 
permanent junk. So stuff that just isn't supposed to be there, but will stay there forever. And um, they'll also do it in dense vegetation um, because it helps cover the burrow entrance. And they're usually about two to three inches long and sometimes they have multiple chambers. Now your active burrows are very smooth on the edge and they don't have any leaves, they don't have any cobwebs. And so that's how you know it's, um, a, it's, you know, not, it's an, not an active burrow. Another way to do it is you can stamp in the burrow and if it's opened up the next day, you'll know that it is an active burrow. Now they'll, they'll also nest in, in lots of places, but generally in, in the wall voids, in the crawl spaces, um, they'll sometimes nest inside furnishings, especially if you have soft furnishings in your yard, like soft furnishings. Um, and so rats also um, are for forage at dawn and dusk, um, and they may forage for food like over several time periods. So there may be periods in the night where you actually have multiple chances of managing rats as well. And so Norway rat behavior is very different than roof rat behavior. If you remember, roof rats actually went to multiple places to get their food. In general, Norway rats actually have like a preferred food source. So like, you know, I like to go and I like to get Italian and Vietnamese and Mexican. Well, they're like these guys, they're like, I'm just gonna go to like the burger place all day, every day until there's no burgers left at the burger place and then I'll pick somewhere else to go. So they will go and they will feed in one place and then they will go back again um, um, to where they came from. Now, generally Nori rats have very small home ranges. And so that's why they kind of feed on the one food source. And that's why they kind of have small home ranges. And so, um, Sometimes they it is actually for a number of reasons it can be easier to control nor or nori rats, but that's one of the reasons they have these smaller home ranges. So let's talk about managing these commensal rodents and mainly rats in California. Now remember that there are multiple options for rodent management, and we of course um, encourage an integrated approach, but I'm going to have more time to talk about some things um, than the other. And so an integrated approach could um, include things like monitoring, sanitation and habitat management, exclusion, trapping, using repellents or fumigants, and then also toxicants too. Now for exclusion, there are so many options um, and it's a really great way to keep rodents out of your home, but it's a difficult thing to teach in a webinar. Um, and so this is actually a really great resource. It's actually designed for cities called Pest Prevention by Design. Um, and it's available freely online. If you just Google Pest Prevention by Design, you'll be able to find it. But we also have this link here that someone will probably magic into the chat for me. Um, so those are things that are really good and you can hire companies. There's even companies that specialize in just exclusion. So if you have problems with rodents getting into your home, you can consider that. What's interesting about habitat modification is, is that um, some in, in very limited study, and that, that's all we have for this is very limited study. It showed that roof rats in particular have very strong affinity for their nest sites. So you could have like, you know, the cleanest yard in the world. And if you somehow have missed this where the roof rat nests all of your mod modifications may make absolutely no difference whatsoever um, and so more study is definitely needed for that um, but it was it's really really interesting the results from that study that actually occurred here in orange county now people always ask me what trap to select and i don't know i can't tell you and we don't have the research that shows one trap is better than the other. What we do ca can give you is some tips and tricks to improve your trapping success. And so what we do know is that size matters when it comes to selecting a trap. You cannot catch a mouse in a rat trap and you cannot catch a rat in a mouse trap. And so that's why it's actually really important to be able to ID the species of rat that you have. And so if you have, you know, you'd be able to tell, hopefully, if it's got like, you know, a tail longer than its body or it's got these big ears, you know, maybe able to tell that it's a roof rat versus it's a mouse. And then you'll be able to select the right size trap. Now, people ask me all the time about expanded triggers. And so um, it's hard to know which one is better than, and, than, than the other. One of the problems with expanded triggers is is that it has moved the 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 point at which the um the trigger bar connects with the head to a different place. So in these old traps that are much harder to set probably um, and definitely less sensitive, the head would be here and the trigger bar would come down on the back. 
what's happening now is that the trigger point is way further extended so essentially this is a bigger bullseye which could be a good thing and a, but maybe a bad thing and so what's happening now is the trigger bar is coming closer to the front of the face and it, the trap doesn't always deliver a kill shot and so that's something to consider when you're using these traps and um, often though these um expanded triggers are easier to set so if you have dexterity options you may want to consider that or you can consider some of the easy to set traps um, and there's multiple examples out there um, and that might be something that you're interested in, but these also have the same idea where the, the point of contact has been shifted now. Um, but some people are working on that, you know, they're adding like teeth to their traps, which um, they say make the, um, make the impact much stronger. Um, people really like these electric traps because you can kill the rat and then you don't have to look at it and you can just dump it into the garbage like that. And so it's definitely something to consider. Um, just be careful because if you're using it outside, um, there may be a fire risk. It is an electrical piece of equipment. So just be careful that it doesn't short or anything like that and cause a fire um, in your backyard. Now, it's really important to choose the right attractant. Um, and here you'll see my friend here that um, really likes his Pringle. Um, and I think it's a Pringle, it could be a Ruffle, who knows. Um, and what we know from research is that rats can learn from their mother's milk what foods are safe to eat. And so that's just an incredible level of sophistication that we have to overcome. And, and that's difficult. Now, what we can use is we can use locally available resources. And these are unfortunately locally available resources from my own yard um, where we can have citrus, you can have tomatoes, or you can have this papaya here that we took, we ended up taking it out because only the rats were eating them. Um, and so you can use these um, certainly as bait for the traps. Now, please don't use um, really expensive cheese from Trader Joe's and also don't use this much of it. And um, you'll notice in many, many of the traps that there's actually like a little bait cup. And in the bait cup, you should be putting that tiny amount, about a pea size amount of, of bait when you're setting your trap. Now we're gonna talk about pre-baiting in a minute. And when you're pre-baiting, you will want to overbait a little bit. And here's an example of how, what happens when you overbait um, a trap. You see the way here, we have the bait cup at the bottom. Then we have this grape. Um, and the grape is extending over the trigger. And the whole idea is, is that your bait is supposed to be below the trigger so the rat can depress the trigger um, to get the bait. And so look what happens to this guy. So doesn't touch the ground, doesn't touch the ground. Oh, touch the ground, decides against it, and then just yanks the bait out, never touches the trigger at all. Now it's really important to cluster your traps. You should have multiple traps when you set them and set them in um, multiple clusters like this. And when I say a lot of traps, I mean so many traps. Okay, we're talking about roof rats here that forage in multiple family um, groups. And so that's really important. Another really important thing to do is to um, focus the energy of your trap. And so I'm just gonna lower this down a bit so I can talk. So the important thing is, is that all the energy goes into the snap. And so you can see here that when you hit the trap, the snap goes off and the trap doesn't move at all. And so all the energy has been focused into the trap. If you didn't secure your trap, what would happen is your trap would jump up and it would you would lose the energy that we need to go into that kill bar. That's the thing that's going to kill the rodent. So that's very, very important. And so it's probably one of the most important things you can do is this word here, pre-bait. Um, and it means that what you do is you're providing food to the rodents, you're getting them used to it. So you can actually control a larger demographic of the population. So you can get the adults and you can get the juveniles. And so basically what you get is you get these traps and you close them and you put the, um, you put the food out on them and you wait till they, the rats feed off it. And then you come back and you set them again. And now you'll notice that this is not a pea size amount. It's actually a lot of bait. And so I like to provide a lot of bait when I pre-bait and then you provide a small amount once you set the trap because you are looking for the 
adult rats because they're the ones that are the most prolific beater breeders and so you have to catch the right rats and how do you know you're catching the right rats well you've catch the right males they're the ones that have the big testicles and if you catch the females they're the ones that have the mammary glands they look pregnant and things like that now one of the things with a trapping program that i implore you to do is to be very very considerate of non-target wildlife and so a lot of people don't want to um you know, use rodenticides because they're really worried about the effects of rodenticides um, up the food chain. But you have to remember that traps also impact non-target wildlife as well. So if you're going to have your traps set during the day, which we don't necessarily recommend, it's better to set them when they're not, at, when, when rats are active and other things are not. And um, you can try putting them under a milk crate, but you have to remember that some wildlife like raccoons or skunks or things like that can also stick their hands through there. So you have to be very, very considerate if you have those things in your yard. And so rats are mostly active at night and things that um, some of the like the songbirds and things like that that can get caught in snap traps are generally not so that might be a strategy that you implore to minimize the amount of damage that you could do for your um your in your snap trapping program now we're also going to talk a little bit about all the active ingredients or the rodenticides that are involved in rodent management we're not going to focus on this too much because there are a lot of things available but most of these are only professionally available um but some of them are available to homeowners for use. And the ones that are available are the first generation anticoagulants, chlorofacinone, difacinone, and warfarin, um, and some of the acute rodenticides like cholecalciferol and bromethylin. Um, but there are other, and there are other ones as well. The other, there are so many different options for rodent management, and we still don't have it down. Um, we have blocks and soft bait and soft blocks. We have grains, we have pellets, we have something called tracking powder. We even have liquid rodenticides or, or liquid formulations um, that can manage rodents. And so they're generally divided up, and I mentioned these already, into the first generation anticoagulant rodenticides, the second generation anticoagulant rodenticides, and the non-anticoagulant rodenticides. And as I mentioned, it's generally the ones that are available for homeowners are this group and this group. And so the ones that would be available for managing rats and mice would be bromethylene and cholecalciferol. But if you also um, choose to manage gophers with a rodenticide, zinc phosphide is also something that's available in your big box stores. Now we do see illegal um, applications of rodenticide and they're not just professional. Sometimes they can be from homeowners as well. So if you do choose to use um, a rodenticide, it's very, very important to follow the label. So please do that. And um, ironically, this illegal application happened outside the UCI PM building, but this was so, something that happened just outside someone's backyard. And both of these are actually examples of illegal applications. Something that people ask me a lot about is contrapest, which is the contraception for um, for rodents or commensal rodents. And this um, uh, product, it, it interferes with ovarian function so that there are either few or no ovulations. And what's pretty smart about this product also is it just doesn't inhibit um, female reproduction. It also can inhibit um, male reproduction, which is pretty neat, but the rats need to eat a lot of it and they need to eat it every single day for it to work. So it's very like human um, contraception, in fact, or human female contraception, like you have to take it at the same time every day, essentially, um, for it to work. Now, it's really important to check the label if you are going to use a rodenticide because the labels can be sometimes very, very confusing. Um, and the reasons I have these two pictures um, up is because often you can use this, use products on this species, which is the roof rat, but you cannot use them on these species, which are wood rats. And so generally on um, labels in California, you get things like not permitted against the use for the following species. And you get this big long list of, um, um, of species. Um, and they're not, these species are not, you're not permitted to use these. So essentially you're breaking the law if you use um, most of these rodenticides to control any of these species. And that's why we spend time on rodent ID because you cannot manage what you cannot measure. 
Um, and so it's really important to know, do you have a roof rat? Do you have a nori rat? Do you have a house mouse? Or do you have a, one of our native rodents? And it's important to know because some of our native rodents do carry fairly significant diseases like deer mice that can harbor hantavirus. And um, so it's important to know these things. Um, and I could spend hours and hours and hours talking about rodents. Um, but unfortunately, I only have 45 minutes. Um, and I think you probably feel like you were, um, you know, machined gunned with ro ro rodent facts. But um, hopefully we have some time for questions. Um, and if we don't have time for questions, you know, feel free to um, send me an email um, or to give me a call. I'd be certainly happy to talk to you on the phone. Um, and please follow us on our social media where we talk about, you know, all sorts of human wildlife interactions. And um, we're on Twitter at SCUWM Council. Um, I also trap and collar and track coyotes in Los Angeles. And you can see, find us on Twitter at Cosmopolitan Coyotes. And we also have a website that discusses my research um, on, on all sorts of different things, but mainly on rats. Um, and that's at www.ucscurry.com. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Neve. That was uh, yes, quite a bit of information, and you know, as as you can all see, there there is a lot to know regarding um, rats. Thank you, everyone. Thank you uh, again, Neve and Belinda and Elaine, and all the participants who uh, came to um, spend your time with us today and talk about rodents. <laughs>